Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me okay and see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to review the exam that we had the other day, exam four, and then we'll move on and finish chapter nine, and then we'll start on chapter 10. Then next week on Monday, we'll finish chapter 10, and then on Wednesday of next week, we'll have our last exam, uh, which will cover chapters nine and 10. The final exam, is then on uh, that Monday, December 7th. And for this class, it's from 11 to 12.20. So we'll have some more information about that then. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that uh, we have one more quiz to do, quiz five. And quiz five will cover chapter nine and that'll be a take home quiz. That'll be available at one o'clock today, and then will be due by Sunday uh, at midnight. So uh, you'll have a few days to do it. I, I'll point out that there is no time limit on how much time you spend on it, but you do only get one attempt. So in other words, if you, if you open the quiz and start taking it, don't close it out and think you can come back later. That's not it's not set up that way. It's set up that once you open it, you'll work on it until you're finished. So once again, uh, the quiz will be available at one o'clock and then is available for the next, next uh, I guess it's four or five days. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so Let's go ahead and, and go through the quiz. I mean, the exam that you had. Uh, first question, describe the difference between po a polar covalent bond and a non-polar covalent bond. Uh, what I was looking for here is, is something about sharing electrons. So in a non-polar covalent bond, the electrons are shared equally. While in a polar covalent bond, you have one of the atoms that attracts the electrons more than the other. N number two, electronegativity is the ability of, as an, of an atom and a molecule to attract electrons to itself. That's true. Uh, three, the greater the difference in electronegativity, the greater the bond length. That is false. Uh, the greater that difference, the shorter the bond length. Number four, what's a simple approach to determine if a compound is ionic or covalent? Uh, I think one of the key things here is just a simple way of knowing, and that is if it's a metal plus a non-metal atom, it's usually ionic. If it's a non-metal and a non-metal atom, then it's covalent. In number five, the question, it's fill in the blank. So in ionic bond formation, the lattice energy of ions increases as the magnitude of the ion charges increase and the radii decrease. So increase, increase, decrease to fill in those blanks. The next question was which of these bonds is the most polar? So that's where you needed to remember the electronegativity table, upper right-hand corner is the most electronegative element. And so in that case, it's fluorine. So HF is the answer. Uh, number seven, question about the Lewis structure of N2H2. So what you needed to do was recognize that the Lewis structure was nitrogen double bonded to another nitrogen and then a single bonded hydrogen on each of those nitrogens and a lone pair of electrons on each of the nitrogen as well. 
So the answer was each nitrogen has one non-bonding electron pair. That's that lone pair of electrons. Number eight, how many electrons are in the Lewis structure for the nitride ion, NO2 minus? So you needed to uh, see how many valence electrons were for nitrogen, that was five. How many for oxygen is six. There's two of those, so that's 12 electrons contributed from the two oxygens. And then since it's a negatively charged ion, there's one extra electron. Um, and so you needed to add that. And if you add up all those numbers, you get a value of 18. For number nine, resonance structures differ by, and the answer is placement of electrons only. And what, what hopefully you thought of when you saw this question was benzene, where we talked about those electrons being shared within the ring. Uh, those, and so uh, atoms don't change, none of the others change, just the electron sharing changes. Number 10, what's the oxidation of iron in Fe2O3? Well, we know that oxygen oxidation number is usually minus two. Um, and so if it's minus two, then minus two times three for the three oxygens is minus six. And so it's a neutral molecule. So the iron contribution has to be plus six to balance it out. We have two iron atoms. So that would mean each iron atom has an oxidation number of plus three. Number 11, which of these Lewis structures would be an incomplete octet? Uh, the answer is BCL3. So the boron is has single bonds with each of the chlorine atoms. And so uh, the boron just has six electrons around it instead of the eight. Number 12, bond enthalpy is always positive. So uh, it always takes energy to go in to break a bond, which is what we're talking about in bond enthalpy. So since energy is going in, it's endothermic and going to be a positive sign. Number 13, what's the electron configuration of cobalt plus two? So if we looked at the electron configuration of cobalt, we would, we would write it out as the argon core, um, 4s2, 3d7. Um, since it's cobalt plus two, that tells us that we've lost two electrons. And the electrons that get lost is that those two 4s electrons, leaving us with the argon core uh, and then 3d7. The next question, Lewis structure of PF3 shows that the central phosphorus atom has one non-bonding and three bonding electron pairs. So in other words, if you drew out that electron configuration, you would see you have a phosphorus atom with single bonds towards each of the fluorine atoms. And then there would be a lone pair of electrons on the phosphorus to complete the octet. Uh, number 15, a screening of the nuclear charge by core electrons and atoms in the, is more efficient than by valence electrons. Uh, we kind of get a feel for that when we think of the, the Slater's rules, which takes into account the location of, of uh, the electrons. In 16, the bonding atomic radius generally increases as we move down a group and from right to left. And so this has to do with the effective nuclear charge and it has to do with that principal quantum number changing. 17, calculate the effective nuclear charge for sulfur. Uh, 
Sulfur is 16, so minus then the core electrons. In this case, it's 10 for a value of six. Uh, some people use the Slater rules. So if you did that, you got partial credit if you use the Slater's rules and did it correctly. Um, you were not asked to use the Slater's rules. This was just a simple effective nuclear charge calculation. If you use the Slater's rules and did the calculation wrong, then you didn't get any points for that. Number 18, the bonding atomic radius or covalent radius is half the distance between nuclei in a bond. That's true. Uh, 19, the electron affinity is the minimum energy required to remove an electron from the ground state of a gaseous atom or ion. That's fault. That definition is for the ionization energy, not electron affinity. Okay, number 20, uh, metals tend to form cations. So metals like to lose electrons, they form cations, and nonmetals tend to form anions. They like to pick up electrons. 21, most nonmetal oxides are acidic, true or false, that one's true. Uh, 22, when alkali metals react with water, the reaction is known to be, it's exothermic. Remember alkali metals, that's sodium, potassium, things like that. We talked about how those metals, when placed in water, it's a pretty, pretty violent reaction. So it's exothermic. 23, lithium plus ion is smaller than lithium atom. That's true. In general, the, uh, you lose valence electrons with those positively charged ions, and so that results in a smaller, uh, smaller size. 24, this was probably the one that people struggled with the most. Um, write a balanced chemical reaction for the reaction of dichloroheptoxide and hydroxide. Uh, the first thing you needed to do was figure out that dichloroheptoxide was Cl2O7. Um, and then if we look at that nonmetal oxide and go back up to question 21, in 21 we said most nonmetal oxides are acidic. So that tells us that this uh, dichloroheptoxide, that's a nonmetal oxide, so it must, it's acidic, acid re reacting with a base, um, gives you water plus a salt. Um, so acid base gives you, a, gives water and a salt in general. And so that's the case here. So then you would have known that water would be one of your products. And so then it was just a matter of figuring out which, um, which salt it was. Uh, the question purposely didn't have a counter ion on the hydroxide, so there should be no counter ion on the hydroxide, no counter ion on the perchlorate. Um, and so the answer is Cl2O7 plus two hydroxide going to two perchlorate plus water. Um, if you had some people uh, had a sodium on the hydroxide and a sodium on the perchlorate, if you did that, you just got partial credit because there was no sodium in the reaction. Um, if you figured out that you were going to form water and then some salt, then you got partial credit for that if you didn't get it exactly right. Um, so if, if you made a reasonable attempt at it and had something that kind of made a little bit of uh, sense in terms of the general reaction, you got some partial credit for that. So 25 through 29, oh, the other thing I'll say about 24 is that was related to one of the homework problems. And so if you, you may have seen that CL207 in some of the homework. 25 through 29 pertains to a homework problem. And there's a couple ways on some of these questions you could have gotten points. And so let me explain that. So the first question of how many valence electrons are found 
Uh, so that's a matter of adding up the valence electrons from the bromine, the valence electrons from each of the oxygen, and then adding an additional electron to account for the next for the negative charge on the on the molecule. And that answer is 26. Uh, for 27, 26 and 27, those questions, it the answer depends on which uh, Lewis structure you drew. So in this, as I said, this was a homework problem and in the, and in the book and in the homework, uh, the Lewis structure was drawn with bromine single bonded to each oxygen. And if you did it that way, then the formal charge of the bromine uh, is seven, the valence electrons minus one half times six, that six is the number of bonding electrons, minus two, which is the number of uh, Lone pair, lone pair electrons, non-bonding electrons, and you'd get a value of plus two. The, the actual preferred way of drawing this structure is bromine with a single bond to one oxygen and double bonds to each of two oxygens. So then if you, if you drew the Lewis structure that way, then the uh, formal charge of the bromine would be seven minus one half times 10 for the bonding electrons minus two, and you get a value of zero. So I accept that either plus two or zero for the formal charge of bromine. For 27, what's the formal charge of oxygen? So once again, your answer will vary depending upon which of those Lewis structures you drew. If you drew the bromine with single bonds to the oxygens, then it's six minus one half times two for the bonding of electrons. And then minus six for the uh, lone pair electrons. And you get a value of minus one. If you drew the structure with the two double bonded oxygens and one single bonded oxygen, then you would have this value of minus one for the single bonded oxygen, but for the double bonded oxygen, you would have you would have a value of six minus one half times four minus four equals zero. The the uh, two double bonds with a single bond is the is the preferred structure because the formal charges work out closer to zero with that way than than they do with the other. But like I said, in the homework, it was, it was done in a way that you had single bonds, but the, the double bond one is, is a little more preferred because of the formal charge issue. So it did, for 26 and 27, you could have either of those answers and you would have gotten credit. Uh, for 28 and 29, we're talking about oxidation numbers. And as we said earlier, uh, Oxygen's oxidation number, unless it's a peroxide, is minus two. So if I look down at number 29, I'll, I know that oxygen is minus two is its oxidation number. So if it's minus two, I have minus two times three for three of them, that's minus six. So then bromine, the whole molecule needs to be minus one. So bromine needs to be an oxidation number of plus five. So if that's plus five, then the contribution from the three oxygens is minus six. That gives me a value of minus one for the overall uh, molecule, which is what I want. So that's kind of a walk through the answers for the exam. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Okay, I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna pull up chapter nine. So hold on for a second here. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do is, last class, last lecture class, um, we started talking about molecular orbital theory and I got through part of it, but I feel like I kind of was rushing a little bit. 
So I'd like to go back and, and start the molecular orbital part over again, just so that um, hopefully that make that a little clearer than it was probably the last time. Um, so I'm going to go back here. We'll, we'll finish off the molecular orbital stuff today, and then I'll move on to the, the last chapter, chapter 10. Um, so a couple things I just want to reiterate about molecular orbital theory. Uh, molecular orbitals are similar to atomic orbitals and some of their characteristics. And some examples of that would be you have two elect maximum of two electrons per orbital. If the two electrons are in the same orbital, they'll have opposite spin. So that's the air, one arrow pointing up, one arrow pointing down thing. Uh, the orbitals have definite energy levels. Uh, and we can visualize the electron density by those contour plots, by those electron density plots. And so even though we'll be talking about molecular orbitals, this is the exact same stuff that we did when we were explaining atomic orbitals. So there are some similarities between them. The big difference is that for atomic orbitals, we're just talking about a single atom. When we talk about the molecular orbital, then now we're talking about things that represent the entire molecule. So now it's looking at that, that bigger picture of things. Um, it's you know, it's kind of like when we talked about electronegativity and polarity of a single bond versus the whole molecule, same kind of idea. So the other thing is, the difference is, is when we have two atomic orbitals that overlap, then we're going to have two molecular orbitals that are formed. And we call those one a bonding orbital and one an antibonding. And these bonding and antibonding orbitals really are how we use to predict if the molecule itself is going to be stable or not. So when we talk about bonding orbitals, we're talking about a combination of atomic orbitals that are constructive. And so we'll see some, some uh, electron density figures in a little bit that kind of highlight what that means. The key thing is, is that since they're constructive, it means they're, the electrons are essentially adding to each other. And this results in a more stable bond, a more stable combination, and it's lower energy. Because remember we say that things that are stable are at lower energy levels. The antibonding orbital, we call those destructive combinations of atomic orbitals. So what that means is, is that it's not an additive process. And so uh, one thing we'll see when we look at these electron density plots is we'll see something called a nodal plane. And this nodal plane in the electron density plot shows that there are no, there's no electron density uh, at that nodal plane. So electron density being zero means there's no possibility of the electrons being there. So that this anti-bonding orbital, it's going to be at higher energy and be, than the bonding orbital. And because it's at higher energy, it's less stable. So this is one thing we'll, we'll show in a minute of how to calculate out something called bond order, which takes into account the number of electrons in the bonding and antibonding orbitals. And that helps us predict whether a molecule is stable or not. So let's take a look at this a little bit more closely in terms of the, the molecular orbital theory. So in this case, we have two hydrogen atoms. And those are represented on the left of this diagram by the two 1s electrons that we have. So remember, hydrogen atom is just has one 1s electron. So we have 1s electron, the, the sphere on the left, 1s electron sphere on the right. When those combine, there's the two choice. There's the constructive combination of the bonding molecular orbital and then the destructive combination 
with the antibonding molecular orbital. So for H2, we have these two choices. The one on the bottom there on the right, we see that those 1s atomic orbitals combining to give us something what we call a sigma, a sigma orbital, sigma bond. And so that's that sigma 1s that we see, that molecular orbital. And we see electron density in between the two nuclei. So that's that constructive combination of these two atomic orbitals, giving us electron density concentrated in between the two nuclei. The other option is the antibonding orbital, and that's up above, and that's the sigma star 1s. And that antibonding, as we said a little while ago, is destructive combination. And because of that, we don't see that electron density in between the two orbitals. And as since we don't see any blue there, that tells us that there's no electron density there, uh, mathematically speaking. And so we have that nodal plane that we talked about before. So this is the, this is the, the molecular orbital case for uh, two hydrogen atom combining. We do something called an energy level diagram or molecular orbital diagram to show how these, these combine. Um, so if we look at the, if the figure at the bottom, what we see is we see that the higher you go up, the higher the energy. So at the bottom of it is lower energy, top of it higher energy. On the left-hand side is the electron configuration for a hydrogen atom. On the right-hand side, the electron configuration for another hydrogen atom. So we see 1s electron and 1s electron. When those combine, we now in the middle have our molecular orbital diagram where we have the sigma 1s, so the bonding molecular orbital at the bottom, that's the lower energy one. Then we have the sigma star 1s, the antibonding molecular orbital above, because that's a higher energy. And we take those two electrons, one from each of the hydrogen atoms, and we place them into the bonding, that sigma 1s molecular orbital. And so we have the spin paired, one up, one down, and then that uses all of our valence electrons from the two hydrogen atoms. So what we see now is we have two electrons in, in the bonding molecular orbital and no electrons in the antibonding molecular orbital. Uh, we can calculate something called the bond order to tell us if this is a reasonable chance of this being a, a stable molecule. And so basically, if we calculate the bond order, and we get a number, then that tells us there's a good chance that this molecule can exist. If we get zero for the bond order, then it tells us that the molecule will not exist because it's not stable. The way we do that calculation is we take the number of bonding electrons. In this case, that's two electrons in that sigma 1s molecular orbital. And then we subtract the number of antibonding electrons. We look at that sigma star orbital, sigma star 1s orbital, and we don't see any electrons, so that's zero. So two minus zero is two. Two times one half is one, so that tells us one bond. So what this bond order calculation does, and this molecular orbital diagram does, is it tells us that hydrogen bonded to hydrogen is something that is, is most likely to happen and it'll be a single bond there. So, and sure enough, we know that H2 is how hydrogen exists. So molecular orbital diagram helps us predict that. So let's take a look at helium. So helium is the next element on the periodic table. So we know that if we write uh, the electron configuration, for helium atom, it's two electrons in the 1s orbital. So we see on our MO diagram, we see on the left there, 
we see two electrons, two 1s electrons for the helium atom. And then on the right-hand side, we see two electrons, 1s electrons for that helium atom. We're going to have the bonding orbital, sigma 1s. We're going to have the antibonding molecular orbital, sigma star 1s. We know that the bonding is lower energy. The antibonding is higher energy. So we draw those. And then we go ahead and fill in our four electrons. We put two down on the bonding, two on the antibonding. And if we go ahead and do our bond order calculation, we have two bonding electrons minus two antibonding electrons. That's zero. Zero times a half is zero. So it tells us our bond order is zero bonds. If it's zero bonds, that tells us that HE2 does not exist. And sure enough, helium exists just as helium itself, not as the diatomic. So by looking at molecular orbitals, by doing the bond order calculation, we saw that in this case, hydrogen H2 does exist because we get a bond order of one. And we see that HE2, helium two, does not exist because that bond order is zero. So some things to keep in mind when you talk about forming molecular orbitals. First, the number of molecular orbitals equals the number of atomic orbitals combined. So we go back here and we see for this helium, helium example, we had two atomic orbitals, one from each helium atom. And so that results in two molecular orbitals, in this case, sigma and sigma 1s and sigma star 1s. So number of molecular orbitals equals the number of atomic orbitals combined. Atomic orbitals combine with atomic orbitals of similar energy. So once again, when we're looking at this example and the, and the hydrogen example, we had 1s, 1s energy levels combining. So similar energy is how they combine. How well two atomic orbitals combine is proportional to their overlap. So in other words, the more overlap you get, the better the effectiveness of the combination of the bond. So the more energy you have, whether the more overlap you have, the energy lowers for the bonding of molecular orbital and the bonding, the, energy of the bonding molecular orbital decreases. So the better the overlap, the more stable, it lowers that energy. So we see here, sigma 1s is lower energy than just the atomic orbitals themselves. And we know that the lower the energy, the more stable it is. Uh, each molecular orbital can only have two electrons and they're with opposite spin. So this is, this is the Pauli exclusion principle, which we learned when we were talking about atomic orbitals. So that carries over to the molecular orbitals. And then molecular orbitals of the same energy are populated, <coughs> excuse me, populated. Uh, as they're populated, one electron enters each orbital with the same spin before pairing. So that's Hund's rule, which we learned for the atomic orbitals so that when we're filling those degenerate orbitals, degenerate, remember that's the, our term for the same energy level, we, we fill in with spin up until we get them all filled, then we start pairing them after they're all filled. So let's talk a little bit about, about bonding and core electrons and molecular orbital diagrams a little bit more. So, uh, the first two examples only involved 1s electrons. So let's go up to lithium. So now with lithium, we're starting to add 2s electrons. So we have core electrons represented by that helium core, and that would fill the 1s uh, orbitals. So sigma 1s and sigma star 1s. 
And then we go up into the 2s orbitals and we would start filling sigma 2s and sigma star 2s in the molecular orbital diagram. So for lithium, three electrons on each. We start putting those electrons in. We start at the bottom and go up, filling sigma 1s with two electrons. Then we fill sigma star 1s with two electrons. Then we go to sigma 2s and we fill two electrons into that orbital. So uh, what you'll notice here is we could go ahead and we could we could calculate our bond order and we would get a we would get a value of one, which would tell us that this lithium lithium is a, a stable uh, molecule. What you see from this is that those core electrons in the 1s and 1s, so the sigma 1s, sigma star 1s, those really don't impact our, our bond order calculation. So just as a lot of times with the atomic orbitals, we didn't really worry too much about those core electrons. We would just write the noble metal uh, symbol and then we would be concerned about the valence electrons. It's similar with these molecular orbitals as well. So those core electrons don't really pay, play much of a part in the bonding. It's those valence electrons from the two atoms that really are the key thing. So there's another similarity between the atomic orbitals and the molecular orbitals. So, you know, we looking at the S orbitals, S atomic orbitals, and looking at that overlap, that's pretty straightforward because as we remember from the lab, the S orbitals are those, are those spheres. And so there's, there's one shape, the overlap is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's not too difficult to visualize that. If you recall with the P orbitals for the atoms, the P orbitals had what I would call dimensionality to it. So we had one that was along the Z axis, one that was along the X axis, and one that was along the Y axis. And in this figure, we see some examples of that. We see the, the ones along the Z axis have the end-to-end -end overlap. We have the X and Y are the ones that kind of that don't have end-to-end -end overlap. They're, they're either vertical or horizontal, and they're kind of side-to-side -side overlap. And remember, this is where we started talking about sigma bonds and pi bonds. Okay, remember the pi bonds were above and, and to the side of the plane, above and below and side-to-side -side of the plane of the bond, whereas the sigma were along the bond line between the two nuclei. So when we talk about molecular orbitals, we're going to see the impact of how these are oriented on what that electron density looks like. So on the left, we have the representation of the electron density for the atoms. So as I said, starting at the top, the Z orientation, then the X and then the Y. Then on the right, we have the molecular orbital from these overlaps. And so then we have the bonding molecular orbital is the lower energy one. The anti-bonding is the higher energy. And here's, and so what we see is, let's look at the PZ one first. We see that we have those lobes overlapping, pretty substantial overlap on this for the PZ uh, P orbitals. And we see a big electron density in between those nuclei. So that's representative of that, of that sigma bond. We see above in the anti-bonding, we see a lot less overlap in between. And we actually see one of our nodes in between, which tells us there's no electrons predicted there. So there's our bonding and anti-bonding, anti-bonding on top, bonding on the bottom. And we see a pretty strong sigma bond. Now with those other p orbitals below, the x and y orientations, now we're getting into the representation for our, our 
high bonding, which remember was like double and triple bonding type of situation. So uh, we see for the X, we see the overlap of the nodes top and bottom. So above and below the, the plane of the nuclei. And then when we see the anti-bonding, we see that node down the middle, so we don't have any electron density there. For the Y orientation, we see once again kind of this, this sideways um, overlap, and that leaves us with the two lobes kind of to, to the front and back, so to speak, of that, of that plane of the nuclei. And the antibonding shows that there's actually a node in the antibonding predicting no electrons along there. So, as I said, the SS overlap is pretty straightforward, I think. The P is a little bit more complicated because you have this three dimensionality coming into play. So, and as a result of that, we have a sigma bond and we have two pi bonds. And so we'll, we'll represent those in our molecular orbital diagram. because Those are gonna be different energy levels. So if we look at the second period element, okay, so second period, we're talking, when we're talking about having P electrons present, that's boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, things like that is what we're talking about. And so when we get to those, we not only have S electrons, so the two S electrons, we have, of course we have the one S, but we have the two S electrons in terms of valence electrons, but we also start to have two P electrons. And what we see, is we have sigma and sigma star for both the S electrons and the P electrons. In addition for the P electrons, we have the pi electrons that we just talked about. And notice in that molecular orbital diagram that the sigma electrons, that's greater overlap, so it's it's a lower energy, so that's that sigma 2p is at a lower energy level than the pi 2p orbitals. Those pi 2p orbitals, we see there two of them, and they're at the same energy level, and so that tells us that they're degenerate. So remember we say that energy levels that are, orbitals that are at the same energy level are considered degenerate. So just as with the 2p atomic orbitals, those three are at the same energy level. Now, the, the molecular p orbitals, the sigma 2p is at a lower because we have a greater amount of overlap, so lower energy, and then the pi 2p is a little bit higher, but those two pi 2p's are the same energy. We also, we also can have s and p orbital interactions. So sometimes the S orbitals can interact with the PZ orbitals more than the PX and PY orbitals. In this case, it raises the energy of the PZ orbital and lowers the energy of the S orbital. Uh, the PX and PY orbitals are still degenerates. In other words, same energy. So we see this, that in the diagram, we see that typically that sigma 2p is below the pi 2p, but as we have more 2s 2p interaction, we can see that energy go up for this sigma 2p. And here's another example of, of, what, of this, of depending upon those interactions, we see that where we have larger interaction, once again, we see that the, the pi 2p energy is a little bit lower, um, small 2s 2p interaction 
we see the sigma 2p is lower. So one concept I want to talk about is, is molecular orbitals and, di and magnetism. So there's two types of magnetism, diamagnetism and paramagnetism. In diamagnetism, there are no unpaired electrons in the orbitals. So every orbital that has electrons, they're spin paired. In other words, one of those arrows is up and one arrow is down. Um, this is important because substances that have this type of a molecular orbital, this where the electrons are all spin paired, that they have a, a, weak, a weak interaction with a magnetic field. If the molecule has one or more unpaired electron, then it has a greater interaction with, the mag with a magnetic field. And so the more unpaired electrons you have, the greater that attractive force is with the magnet. And we call that paramagnetism. So by taking advantage of whether compounds are dia or paramagnetized, It'll, they'll behave differently in a magnetic field. And there's something called nuclear magnetic resonance in MR, which is a field which people can identify molecules and get a feel for structure based on how the molecule behaves in a magnetic field. So that's why this, this magnetism, which we can assess through the molecular orbital calculations, is important. So up until now, we've talked about diatomic molecules, in other words, just two atoms. But in each case, the two atoms were the same. So now let's take a look at an example of where the two atoms are different. In this case, we're talking about NO. So we have a nitrogen atom and we have an oxygen atom. And so we would Look at the number of valence electrons for the nitrogen. In this case, it's five. We look at for oxygen, that's six. And so we see those uh, orbitals for the different atoms, the two atoms represented there. So for the nitrogen, we have two S electrons. We have one electron in each of the P orbitals. In the oxygen atom, we have two ele S electrons. And then we have uh, four electrons in the two p orbitals. And then we would go and in the middle have our molecular orbital diagram for the NO molecule. So we'd start with sigma 2s, sigma star 2s. So the 2s electrons would go in there. Then we would start with the p electrons, sigma 2p, then pi 2p, pi star 2p and sigma star 2p. So we would go ahead, we'd fill in those four electrons from the 2s, electrons from the two atomic orbitals. Then we'd start filling in, we'd have a total of seven electrons that we would put in for 2p. So we fill sigma 2p orbital, then the, the two pi 2p orbitals to fill out those bonding molecular orbitals. Then we start adding electrons, in this case, one electron to the antibonding pi star 2p orbital. So we would, we would combine those as you might expect using the valence electrons from the, the two individual atoms. What you also notice though, is that when we drew these other molecular orbitals, let me go back to one here, in this case, when we, when we did this one, we said that the atomic orbitals on each side were at the same energy level. So in other words, the 2p and the 2s on the left are the same energy level as on the right. When we have a diatomic molecule that has two different atoms, then the atom that is more electronegative will be a little more stable and its energy will be a little bit lower. So we look in this case with nitrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. 
So the oxygen energy levels are slightly lower than the nitrogen energy levels. And so we see that little bit of an offset there. So we look at the 2S and we see the 2S box for the oxygen atom is lower than the 2S box for the nitrogen atom. Same with the P electrons, slightly lower for the oxygen versus the nitrogen. Uh, the other thing we see is that this means that the energy level for the atomic orbital, in this case for oxygen, is closer to the molecular energy level for the molecules, molecular orbital. And so, uh, once again, the more electronegative atom will be slightly lower in energy for its atomic orbitals versus the other atom, and it'll be a little bit closer to the molecular orbital energy levels. So there's some homework associated with this. Please take a look at it. A uh, couple of things I just comments I wanna make in general about the molecular orbital stuff is, as you probably see, there are a lot of similarities between working with the atomic orbitals and the molecular orbitals. The big difference is, is you start to do this on a molecule scale and by doing the bond order calculations and things like that, you can start to predict whether or not a molecule is stable. The other thing you probably picked up on is we really looked at some pretty basic examples here. Um, we initially looked at hydrogen, then we looked at helium, we worked our way up to lithium, but in each of those cases, we weren't talking about very many electrons and we were talking about diatomic molecules. So it's a pretty simple molecule. And we were talking about, in those cases, the same atom. At the end here, we branched out a little bit. And while well, we st stuck with uh, diatomic molecules, we did have an example of two different atoms. So we see a little bit of more complexity in that, where we start to see some of these energy levels shifting. As you get more and more involved with these types of molecular orbital diagrams and things like that, you see a lot of shifting of energy levels and it just gets a little more complex to figure it out. We're not gonna get involved with a lot of that, but I just wanted to mention it, that, that this is a taste of, of what goes on in trying to predict the stability of some of these molecules and that. And by looking at some of these uh, more straightforward examples, you get a feel for how you go about doing that. So that wraps up chapter nine. As I said, your quiz, your online quiz uh, that will be available today at one, that is, will cover chapter nine. Uh, any questions on the molecular orbital stuff before I move on to the next section? Okay, let me give give me a moment here and I'll pull up the next slides. Okay, so we spent the last few weeks talking about atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals, all that kind of stuff, um, electron configurations. So now we're gonna shift gears quite a bit. We're gonna go and we're gonna talk about gases. And so this will be a little different focus than what we've had. Um, so when we talk about gases there's a few few things we want to we want to mention uh, one is is that for gases the physical properties are pretty similar for all gases so their chemical properties may differ but their physical properties are pretty much the same so in other words all gases kind of have the have the same 
physical nature versus when we talked about solids, you could have differences there. Liquids, you could have differences. Gases, the physical properties are pretty similar. Gases are usually composed of non-metallic elements and usually the molecular formulas are pretty simple and the molecular weights are usually fairly low. Um, unlike liquids and solids, gases will expand to fill their containers. So in other words, if you put it in a one liter container, it'll fill up the container. You put it in a two liter container, it'll fill up the two liter container. Whereas liquids, if you have one liter of liquid, it fits in a one liter container. Uh, it doesn't fill up more if you put it in a bigger container. So gases expand to fill their containers. Uh, by that same idea, they're also compressible. So if you have it in a big container, you can usually squeeze it down and put it in a smaller container. Uh, and the reason for this is they have really low densities. So if you think about density, um, Gases aren't very dense. There aren't that, that many molecules floating around. And so that's one reason why you can compress them. Uh, and then finally, if you have two or more gases, they will form a homogeneous mixture. So when we talked about solutions and things like that, we could have precipitants in it and we could see solids in it and things like that. For gases, if you have a couple of gases, they will, they will blend together and become homogeneous with time. Um, and that centers around the movement that we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, some common gases, and so these are things that at room temperature are common, some of which you may have heard of. Uh, hydrogen cyanide, that's a very toxic gas. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S. If you ever hear that rotten egg, ever smell that rotten egg smell, that's usually hydrogen sulfide. Um, carbon monoxide, that's the thing you worry about, uh, you hear about in people's houses sometimes and they, they die from it. Uh, one problem with it is it's colorless, odorless, and very toxic, so that's why people don't know what's there. Uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, so that's what we hear about, about emissions in the environment all the time. Once again, it's colorless, it's odorless. Uh, methane. Is, is flammable. Uh, ethylene, C2H4, uh, that's interesting just because that's a gas that's used to ripen fruits. They ripen bananas that way, uh, but it's used to help ripen fruits. Propane is what you would use in your grill if you have a gas grill. Uh, nitrous oxide, sometimes people call that laughing gas and, and they'll use it at dentists and some places like that as a sedative. Um, NO2, uh, that's one of the few that we'll see that, that has some color to it and it does have a toxicity to it. Uh, ammonia and sulfur dioxide, two others. Um, one thing I'll point out about these gases is that most of them are colorless. So a lot of times people will see gases coming out of smokestacks and things like that and they, they wonder what it is. More often than not, that's actually just water vapor because most of the gases that we worry about are colorless and so you don't, you don't see them. So the, the gas that we're most familiar with and, and is most important to us is, is simply air. And so uh, let's talk about what is air made of. So air, you know, we always talk about we need oxygen to breathe. And so there's certainly oxygen in air, but oxygen only makes up about 21% of air. Air is predominantly nitrogen. So air is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then lower levels, less than 1% of argon, CO2, neon, helium, and some other, other assorted gases. So uh, we need oxygen certainly to live, but really air is mostly nitrogen. So properties that define the state of a gas sample. So the properties that help us define what's going on with the gas are temperature, pressure, volume, and then the amount of gas. When we talk about amount of gas, we usually talk about it in terms of number of moles. 
Well, we've talked about temperature a bit in the past and volume and moles. So, so I think everyone knows what those are, or rather volume, but pressure is one we haven't really talked about much. So we'll talk a little bit about, about uh, pressure and what that means. So when we think of pressure, think of a swarm of particles. So if you think of gas molecules, Think of it almost like a, a bunch of, of bugs flying around. So gas molecules are always moving. They don't stay still. And as they move around, they can run into each other and bounce off each other. And they also can run into the, the walls of the container. And it's this sum of the collisions, so the collisions of one gas molecule, which another with another or one gas molecule with the wall of the container. It's the sum of all those collisions, which, which is how we get pressure. So pressure is the, is the sum of the collisions based on the area. So it's force per unit area. So that's why if we have a big container and measure the pressure and then keep the number of molecules constant, but put it in a smaller container, we're gonna have more collisions, so the pressure would increase. You hear people talk about atmospheric pressure. Well, that's the weight of air per unit area. And then also, once again, pressure is directly proportional to the number of gas molecules that are present. Pressure is one of those measurements that has a lot of different units associated with it. So if you see any of these units, remember that they're all related to, to measuring pressure. So we start with Pascal's, bar is another unit, millimeters of mercury, that's that MMHG, or also known as TOR, T-O-R-R. -R. Those are no, another measure of uh, pressure. And then atmospheres is, is another. Uh, and so the atmosphere, so for standard atmospheric pressure, standard atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere. One atmosphere equals 760 torr or 760 millimeters of mercury. So at the bottom there, you see the interrelationship between all of these, these units. The figure that you see here is a type of barometer. So barometer is, is the thing you'll hear about with the weathermen and things like that. And so the way that works is, is in this particular one, you have, uh, you have a pool of mercury, you have a column that's been evacuated and the pressure that pushes down on that mercury. So in other words, that's the atmospheric pressure results in mercury going up the tube and that, that distance from the pool to the top of the mercury measured in that tube, that's literally millimeters of mercury. And so that, that height there that you're measuring is the, is the barometric pressure. In, in more of the chemistry world, we'll use something called a manometer. And that's used to measure the difference in pressure between the atmosphere and some container that has a gas in it. So the way this works is you see on the left there, you see a container with gas in it. You hook up this tube to it. The tube has mercury in it. And then the other end of it is open. So it's open to the atmosphere. So you have the atmospheric pressure pushing down on one end of the tube. You have the gas in the, in the container in the vessel pushing on from the other end based on how much gas is in there. And so it's that you use that information, you get the gas pressure is the difference. You do this measurement of the, of the height and then add that to the atmosphere pressure to get the pressure of the gas. So it's that, it's that total value there that you get 
of the pressure from the gas, from the atmosphere rather, and then that height difference in the, in the manometer. Let's talk a little bit about how these different properties of gases relate to each other. So pressure, that's usually represented by P. Amount, as I said before, is usually represented by moles, and that's, and that's symbolized by the small n. Volume is usually expressed in liters, and that symbol is V. And this one's important. Temperature is expressed in Kelvin. So just as before, we had some calculations where we express temperature in Kelvin in order to make the formulas to work. When we talk about gases, it's the same thing. We need to, when we work with temperature, we need to change it from degrees C to Kelvin. And remember that's the, the 273 added to, to the degree C. If one of these things changes, the others change. And one of the things we're gonna explore here is just what those relationships are. The first one we're gonna talk about is Boyle's Law. And in Boyle's Law, that tells us that if we have the volume of a fixed quantity of gas at constant temperature, that that is inversely proportional to the pressure. So what that means is, is that if the pressure of a gas is increased and we've, we've kept the temperature constant and we've kept the amount of gas in terms of moles constant, that the volume will decrease. Um, and we can express this mathematically as P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So P1 and V1 are that initial pressure and volume values, P2 and V2, are the pressure and volume values that we'll get if we do a change. And so this tells us that pressure and volume are inversely related. And it makes sense, because if you think about it, if you have your gas molecules and you put it in a smaller space, then they're gonna collide with each other more often. They're gonna hit the walls more often. So you decrease that space, the pressure is going to go up because we said a pressure is basically the measurement of those collisions. Let's look, let's look at an example. Let's look at an example for, for this type of calculation. So if we had a weather balloon and it was inflated to 55 liters and we're at we're at a place where the atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. And then we wanted to find the volume of the balloon if it started going up in the air and the atmospheric pressure was now 135 millimeters of mercury. So if you think about the balloon, balloons are pretty flexible so they can expand or contract. And so now what we want to do is, assuming temperature hasn't changed, assuming the number of moles of molecules hasn't changed. And so now, as we've changed this pressure from 755 millimeters of mercury to 135, what's our new pressure, what's our new uh, volume going to be? So our V1 is 55 liters. Our P1, we said, was 755 millimeters of mercury. The new pressure, P2, is 135 millimeters of mercury. This should say uh, V2 instead of P2 there. We're trying to solve for V2. And so that's where we said Boyle's law told us that P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Well, we know P1. We know V1 and we know P2, so we just need to solve for V2. If we rearrange Boyle's law to solve for V2, we'll take that P2 and divide it by both side into both sides. And so now we have V2 equals P1 times V1. We can then go and just simply fill in our values for those variables, and we see that. Uh, under this new pressure, 
as the pressure decreased, the volume is going to increase in that balloon. And now it's gone from 55 liters to 308 liters. So there's an example of, of how pressure and volume for gases are related. By changing that pressure, we change the volume. Pressure went down, volume went up. So that's that inverse relationship that we talked about. The next one we're gonna talk about is Charles Law. I'm gonna stop there for today. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, just to remind you once again, uh, Monday we'll finish up chapter 10. Next Wednesday, we'll have an exam covering chapters nine and 10. Uh, your final will be that following Monday, the 7th at 11 o'clock. And then the final thing I wanted to mention was there is the take home quiz that will be available on Canvas starting at one today and you have till uh, late Sunday to turn it in. Um, so please go ahead and do that as well. Uh, hope you enjoy your Thanksgiving holiday and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.